This is our annual tax hearing where uh, we have a board meeting and uh, we'll listen to public comments regarding the proposed tax rate that we need to set. And by law, that has to be set by September 1. Um, your uh, material for this tax rate hearing should be in one large PDF file. It's about 15 pages. And for those of you who used to read the budget book religiously, you, that is basically the old tab three of the, of the big, thick budget book that we used to produce. Um, and as you know, uh, as hopefully you know from me telling you over and over, is that there are really two different components to our tax rate, and they're computed separately. One being the operating tax rate, um, which all monies derived from that levy can be used to operate the school district um, through the general fund, teachers fund, capital projects fund. We, we just so happen to place all of our levy into the operating fund and we can get money in the others uh, through revenue placements and transfers if need be. Uh, the second component would be the debt service uh, tax rate and uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, in a minute, but those are basically two separate components. They're computed differently, but it all goes into uh, some documents that we have to prepare and provide to the county clerk before September 1. So uh, I'm going to not go through everything in detail, but I do want to walk you through a couple of important points. Obviously, one of the one of the key pieces of information in computing both of these levies is our assessed valuation and that's provided to us by the county clerks and of course th this district has uh, property in both St. Francis and St. Genevieve counties so we uh, receive those notices from those counties uh, early in the summer generally they're adjusted at least once sometimes more than once uh, the information you have in front of you is basically the second notice I received um, on those where there's been Board of Equalization, for instance, in St. Genevieve County and some changes made in St. Francis County. I do want to point out that um, we did have assessment growth overall as a district of about $6.6 .6 million. And while that may sound great, and it is great, um, that's all derived from new construction. And the one thing I do want to point out um, is that our new construction actually exceeded that total growth by about, uh, I think it was 80,000, by just a little. But that's the third year consecutively, third year running, where the new construction has accounted for more than all of the growth. And what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that the assessments on existing property have decreased. So this becomes important um, you know, even though, even though the entire amount is on the tax books and our tax levy will be applied to that, it, it is important when you go into the calculation, especially the operating levy. Um, and the state reassessment forms are in there. I don't know that you want to follow them line by line. But this is a form that, uh, that we produce, that the board approves, that then goes to the county clerks, that then goes to the state auditor. And the state auditor reviews these documents they review the calculation of both our operating and our debt service tax levy, and they issue a certification letter um, that they find that the tax rate has been set in compliance with law in Missouri. So it's very important that we, uh, that we have this right. Um, with regards to our operating levy, as I mentioned before, um, one of the key factors in that is the, what they call the uh, net assessment growth. And in doing so, you basically take our total assessed value for this year and subtract out the new construction. And as I mentioned, when you compare that to the previous year assessed valuation, that number is actually negative, and that's the third year in a row. And this is important because in Missouri, if, if any of you can remember back when the economy was really good and property was worth a lot of money and it was increasing at, at fantastic rates, Missouri actually has some, this process in place to put the brakes on political subdivisions, increasing your tax rates tremendously in one year. And it's through this mechanism where you look at this, at your net assessment growth, and you're allowed to use the lower of three percentages. The net assessment growth percentage, the increase in the consumer price index, or there's a statutory 5%. Well, in this case, and for the last few years, um, our percent is zero. 
In other words, that's the additional revenue that we're able to grow on existing property on, on re, from reassessment. Um, so we're not even, the assessments are not even increasing at the consumer price index increase level, which this year was 3%. And our number was negative, so in fact is zero. Um, one document that's not in there, but, but it, it's some numbers that were posted in our public notice, and it's required to be posted in our public notice, is uh, new operating revenue from reassessment. And after going through the computation of our proposed tax rate for our operating funds, you basically say, okay, we had $6.7 million of new construction. That's great. That's going to generate $193,000 in additional money. But the new revenue from reassessment actually comes out to be a negative number. In other words, the total new revenue of $112,000, when you take our proposed tax rate times our current assessed value, you compare that to the previous year assessed value at the previous year's tax rate, our total new revenue for operating should be about 112000 but 190000 of that comes from construction. So you can see that we actually lose money on existing property because the reassessments just aren't increasing. In fact, they're decreasing. And that has the effect on this calculation of keeping your operating tax rate down. So I know this might be a little confusing. It's not confusing to me because I've looked at it every day for the last three weeks. But basically, what I've computed is a tax rate ceiling for operating purposes of $2.8648. That's actually 2.53 cents less than last year's. And that is our what, what is termed operating tax rate ceiling. <clears throat> Based on the numbers that we have now with the assessed value, working through the calculation, that is the maximum amount we could levy for operating purposes this year. And that head number has not grown much for, for a while. So basically, that's, that's what that calculation is doing. We've had very little growth. The assessed value is pretty, pretty flat, except for new construction. We're not getting any growth from existing property. So that tax rate remains the same. It actually goes down about um, 2.5 cents on the, on the operating tax rate. Um, in case anyone's interested, I just ran, you know, just ran a number. If, if you have a, fair, a home worth, uh, with a fair market value of $100,000, uh, that 2.53 cents is going to save you about $4.81 on your tax bill it's about an $80,000 loss in operating funds for the school. So anyway, uh, that's going to be our recommended rate. It's, it's the maximum we can levy. Uh, we have not voluntarily rolled back the operating levy for quite some time. So we're basically at our max. With respect to the debt service levy, it's a totally different calculation. It's the, the concept of net assessment growth really doesn't come into play. It's basically your total assessment. And the debt service calculation, as hopefully most of you remember from the public workshop with Mr. Hart and Ms. Perkins, is really based on your debt schedule um, when, and, the pay, and the amount of money you need to generate to make those payments. Uh, the documents that I presented to you here and the administra administrative recommendations follow along with the public workshop information that we had from Mr. Hart um, and whereby with board approval, we can prepay over a million dollars of the, of the 2008 bonds, shorten that by uh, the maturity by a year, and actually save about 146,000. Uh, that also puts us in a great position to look at some future refinancing, uh, because even though the rates were low a few years ago when we issued the bonds, they're even lower now. And Mr. Hart says that we can save some more money, so that'll put us in a great position to do that. So the recommendation that you have for the debt service levy is, is 90 cents. The calculation, I think, was actually 97.84 cents, but um, we can roll back the 7.84 cents and keep it at 90 cents. That'll be the same debt service tax rate that we had last year. So when you take those two components, um, that's what our recommendation is, is that we would levy the maximum amount allowed for operating purposes. Um, which is the 2.8648, and that we would keep the debt service levy at 90 cents.
for a total levy of three dollars point seven six four eight cents, um, which is like I said, is about a, a two point five cents. Or yeah, two point five cents decrease from last year. Um, that's really about all I have on that. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any audience members who have any questions for Mr. Eaton or Mr. Hart? Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> If there's nothing else you can end the hearing. If, if anyone has, uh, doesn't have any other questions or comments, we can uh, call for an end to the hearing. Take a break to five. Mm -hmm. So do we don't need a motion for that? You think? Sure. Okay. Would anyone like to move to end the hearing? Um, so move. Do I hear a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Good evening. I'm going to call this meeting to order and I'm going to turn it over to Colonel Winnegar. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand. We're going to say the Pledge of Allegiance. instructor at Farmington High School and tonight I'm honored to help recognize one of our own that's recently received one of our nation's highest military awards. Would Major Daniel Thompson please come over here and stand by me. Major Thompson's recently been awarded the Bronze Star by the United States Army for outstanding performance in Iraq in 2004. The award was delayed due to an administrative error and was resubmitted recently with the help of Congresswoman Joanne Emerson. The Bronze Star Medal is a U.S. Armed Forces individual military decoration that's awarded for bravery, acts of merit, or outstanding military service. It is the fourth highest combat award in the U.S. Armed Forces. The citation accompanying Major Thompson's Bronze Star reads as follows. Would you all please stand? the United States of America, to all who shall see these present, greetings. This is to certify that the President of the United States of America, authorized by executive order on 24 August 1962, has awarded the Bronze Star Medal to First Lieutenant Daniel E. Thompson of the 1140th Engineer Battalion for meritorious service from 3 January 2004 to 23 August 2004, while serving as platoon leader, Company A, the 1140th Engineering Battalion. 
First Lieutenant Thompson's superior training skills and keen attention to detail allowed the unit to execute all counter-improvised explosive device operations without injury to personnel or damage to equipment despite the inherent dangers. His selfless service, outstanding leadership, and dedication to duty enabled the unit to achieve and maintain a high level of mission success. First Lieutenant Thompson's actions are in keeping with the finest tradition of military service and reflect great credit upon himself, the 1140th Engineering Battalion, and the United States Army. Given under my hand in the city of Washington this 24th day of May, 2012, and it's signed by the Secretary of the Army, John M. McHugh. Congratulations, that is. of military service and as commander for two years I have never been a participant in an award medal this high so outstanding Thank you. Thank you very much. I know <laughs> Dan we are very proud of you we are very much and I will let you know this was not just my idea Okay, so you'd be nice to me the rest of the week <laughs> and the rest of the year because I'm really glad you're my assistant because you diffuse a lot of things <laughs> and you keep everybody safe. But on a serious note, um, we Dan started his teaching career as a special services teacher in Rock, Sp Rock Springs, Wyoming. Um, and in 2000, we were lucky enough to hire him here at Farmington. He started as a special services teacher, was a process coordinator, and is now the assistant principal at Lincoln. And um, he teaches us a lot. And if um, we can learn anything, it's that, I can't, I, you had this quote on the side of your file cabinet and I was gonna bring it and I forgot it. Do you remember it? Yes. Would you say it? <laughs> Son of a gun. I'll make sure everybody gets it. But I think it's something to the effect of never giving up and that as long as you persevere you can accomplish anything and i'm really excited thank you really excited to have him as my partner and even more excited to recognize his wife who is here rhonda and his son hunter who were a part of this too yes yeah so it's all of us yes but we are very proud of you you're welcome you're welcome Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, unfortunately, it's down to business, so I need a, a motion to approve the agenda with the exception of item 8F. I so move. Moved. I need a second. 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 Go ahead. Okay, moved and seconded. All those in favor? Okay, and just a little board dialogue. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to be able to participate in something that feels this good. And just as a, an addendum, we have red, white, and blue food. And um, I want to wish Shanna a happy birthday. <laughs> Welcome to your 30s, darling. <laughs> Okay, um, any communications? Uh, Dr. Winslow. I'm actually filled in for Dr. Winslow. Uh, good, 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 good. I'm Todd McKinney, Assistant Principal of Farmington Middle School, and uh, I've been called in to pinch hit today. So, I, uh, I have two staff members there at the middle school that we're going to recognize here tonight. The first one is uh, Harlan Hero, and that goes to Morgan Comnick. If you would come up here, Morgan. I've uh, I've just worked with Morgan here a short while now, but I can I can tell you I can vouch for everything Dorothy uh, wants me to read here uh -oh. about Morgan. Uh -oh. So uh, <laughs> I've been I've been very impressed with Morgan in the short time I've been there, and I can tell you she's kind of the the Jose Akendo of the building. She does a little bit of everything, and <laughs> and she does a very good job at it. But I'm going to read uh, I'm going to read here what uh, what Dr. Winslow would have me read about Morgan. <clears throat> it says the 2011-2012 uh, Farmington Middle School leadership team selected Morgan Comnick as the August Heartland hero. Morgan was a long-term sub in the building for most of the 2011-12 school year. 
It was a long-term position that Morgan filled. Uh, it was a half-day morning position, but there are many days at about 11.55 that one of the secretary's teachers or administrators would rush into her room in a panic, asking her to stay for the afternoon because of a late-minute emergency. <clears throat> Morgan could do anything. Uh, with limited uh, notice, ranging from watching large study halls, supervising many, many students in the library, teaching any subject she was asked to teach. There were some times that she was totally without plans, but she improvised. Students always had something to do. Well, when she found out that the middle school students were struggling with some grammatical GLEs on the map, she made an entire keyboarding unit based on grammar, uh, such as punctu punctuation, semicolons, other high area needs. Above and beyond the areas just mentioned, Ms. Comnick's one of the nicest, kindest people serving students in the Farmington R7 School District. She's always courteous and always has uh, the other person in mind when she speaks. She forms relationships with the kids and they respond. She simply fails to give up on students. We're very fortunate to have Ms. Comnick on staff as a paraprofessional at the middle school this year. She has some rather large study halls, but she has everything under control. Uh, and what Dr. Winslow wanted me to say thank you for your care and concern and uh, for just being very helpful in the middle school and we really thank appreciate you, it. Thank you very much. And Morgan's, Morgan's family is here. Morgan, would you like to introduce your, your family? Uh, yes. The man in the dragon shirt is my husband, Derek. And then the two, the lovely couple there is my mother, Chris, and my father, Jeff. Yes, and of course you guys remember Mr. Strawn as the teacher yes, in the Mr. district. Strong. <laughs> yes, Mr. Strawn. And here's a plaque that we have oh, for you. Thank you. Morgan, but again, we, we appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you very sir. much. Thank you, Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again, Morgan. We appreciate it. The next individual that I'd like to introduce to you all is our featured teacher, and that's Scott Doty. <laughs> Scott is, uh, he's a glutton for punishment. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, I've known Scott for a long time, actually. I've not worked in the same building with Scott. I knew uh, Scott before he ever got into education. His wife worked with my wife as a graphic designer many years ago, so I've known him for a long time. And then when he decided to get into education, he did his student teaching with me, actually. He, was, uh, he went into social, he's actually social studies certified. That's not what he works in. He works in special services. And he's the go-to guy in the middle school and, and any building he's been in. If you have tough kids that you need, uh, you know, you need somebody to talk with those kids and mentor those kids, it's Scott. So he has a very tough job, so I can vouch for that. And uh, I'm, I'm really blessed to work with him in the middle school. Uh, and I, I'm going to read uh, what Dorothy has here. Uh, the 2011-12 Farmington Middle School Leadership Team instituted a new process for selecting feature teacher. Uh, since we have the August time slot, it's always been difficult in making selections at the, beginning, at the beginning of the school year. So last year we started the selection process basically in October. Teachers were able to nominate worthy candidates throughout the entire year. Each nomination was accompanied with a short paragraph why the person submitting the nomination felt that that teacher was deserving of being recognized. At the last staff meeting of the year, all the nominees were introduced and the paragraphs were read about each teacher. It was an uplifting experience to hear all the cool things the teachers did for students throughout the entire year. Just being nominated truly was an honor. As part of the teacher checkout, teachers turned in a ballot voting for one of the nominated teachers. This year we celebrated our featured teacher in Harlan Hero uh, during the beginning of the year staff meeting. That's when Scott realized that he was a featured teacher. We let the cat out of the bag a little early. This year's winner is obviously Scott Doty. Actually, he's a first-year teacher at the middle school full-time. He was there part-time last year. He took charge of a program that's very difficult, and it was, uh, it was very challenging to manage. He uh, not only helped students, but he helped the entire staff uh, see reasons behind why students acted out like they do, and he offered ways and helped us uh, think up our own ways of dealing with difficult situations. At times, I'm sure he felt like there were uh, slow learners, but he hung in there with us. With Mr. Doty, it's all about the kids. He can de-escalate an angry student with ease. Teachers never see Mr. Doty lose his temper with students or lose his razor-sharp focus on students. He's been able to be an integral part of the transitioning pr uh, process for students back into the school setting. <clears throat> Some who we might have thought can never return to the school with success, he's got to return. As Dr. Winslow was watching students enter the building for the first time this year, she noticed the students who had worked with Mr. Doty last year flocking to him, and that in itself is a big statement because these students generally aren't real excited to be at school, especially at the beginning. That's not, 
said that what normally isn't a great time of year for students who have not liked school to return uh, with smiles on their faces we're willing to do this for mr doty and they also gave him a hug so it was truly rewarding to watch this so we thank you scott for what you do for students we've also got Thanks again. We, we certainly appreciate your service. Very flattered. Thank you. Good to see you, too. Good job. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Eaton. Featured staff. Well, it's my honor tonight to present an award to a, to a staff member. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of people in this district who work behind the scenes and, and are so valuable to the operations of the district, and, and they don't seek recognition, and, uh, but they deserve it. And uh, this person would never seek recognition, but uh, we're going we're gonna to recognize her anyway. So uh, if Terry Roney is here. <laughs> Terry is, uh, I've worked with Terry now for I guess 12 years. I think she came here in, in 2000 and she's done a variety of things here and uh, uh, to say that, you know, she, she pays our bills and, and makes sure we get that done, but to say that's all she does uh, is missing so much. She helps me so much with uh, budget, ledger, I know she assists with payroll and, and she does a lot of things for the district. And, you know, I think Terry was uh, actually a 1990 grad of Farmington. Which sounds about right, judging from some of the big hair pictures I've seen. Hardly <laughs> <laughs> recognized. Her. But you know, she's one of those people that's so invested in this district and in this community. I mean, she's a graduate. Um, you know, she's so proud. Our kids, uh, recent graduate, one of them, and then others in school. And I know she's proud of her family, and they're all back there. Kevin and the kids are back there. Sister, dad. And, uh, you know, she's just one of those people that's that's so invested in this place, and she cares so much. And you know, uh, a recent event, I guess. Uh, you know, we have an accounting department of three, and uh, the other two that I get to work with are the best people I know. And one of them is out right now, and we miss her. And uh, you know, at a busy time of year for all of us, um, I went to Terry and I said, "Hey, how would you like to do payroll?" <laughs> and you know, just typical Terry, she, she didn't flinch. Yeah, okay, let's go. And she kind of took that on over the last few weeks, and uh, she's the reason everybody got paid. <laughs> <laughs> and she did a great job. And uh, you know, that, but that's not unusual for Terry. I mean, just pretty much anything you ask her to do, well, she'll take it on, and she'll and she'll do it very well. And. Uh, she actually is the voice of our school district when you dial the phone system, in case anybody didn't know that. So, um, we don't pay Terry, I didn't open this up yet, but we're, we're honored, and I know your coworkers uh, appreciate you because you're always willing to help. And in fact, I hadn't told anybody that she was going to get this award. And a few days ago, one of her coworkers said, Oh, I don't know when it's your turn to give the award, but I think Terry ought to get it. <laughs> Got you covered, man. <laughs> I was your alumni. <laughs> so this is very deserving. We're very proud of Terry. And I'm very lucky to get to work with her because I depend on her a lot more than she depends on me. So classified employee of the month for August 2012, Teresa Roney. Congratulations, Terry. <laughs> We are fortunate to, uh, tonight to have two students with me here from Lincoln Intermediate and they have a presentation to make. Hi, my name is Savannah. My name is Brooke. We are here because we are part of the Young Faith in Christ. The Young Faith in Christ donated over 200 school supply items to Farmington. 
We wanted to let the board know about the donation and how much we appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Very good, girls. We did, um, the uh, Young Faith in Christ uh, is a group that comes after school on Fridays, and these young ladies have got to spend their Friday afternoons um, with the organization. And um, they also, the Young Faith in Christ has a mentoring program that comes and helps in the schools. Um, and Dr. Thomas and Ron Farrell and I were very fortunate to get to go to their luncheon and uh, talk about how much of an impact they have made on the kids that they've mentored. I think, um, oh, to help me if I, tell me if I'm wrong, how many of them had made? 80% made gains in behavior and over 50% in academics. So, you know, and that was, and they started in third quarter. So I'm really excited for this year because we're gonna have them all year long and can't wait to see the impact that they've made. But you know, whoever's watching out there from that organization, we do truly appreciate all your help to all of our kids. So, very good, girls. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, ladies. Thank you very much. Is um, anyone here from CTA this evening? Oh. Okay. Okay. So that's a no. All right, we'll move on to the superintendent's report. And my report this evening is right on time. We'll let the people leave because I'm going to introduce to you Tom Nickus, who's going to be speaking um, to the board and introducing or reintroducing himself to our community and to our board. So, Tom, please come forward. You are right on time. <laughs> Thanks for having us tonight. Thanks for coming. We appreciate it. Uh, some of you know, you may know Sarah. Sarah Schmanke, um has, between Sarah and I, other than special education, you know, we did uh, we did the work for the district, and uh, it's kind of a, this is kind of fun because we got here a little bit earlier, and to hear you recognize some of your students and some of your staff, that's what that's what that's all about. Sarah and I get involved in. To clean up some of the messy business to help you get through some of those things, but that's what this is really all about. It's about kids and teachers and doing good things. I remember back to my days when I was a superintendent that uh, uh, I was way too young for the job, and, and I sat in this little brick building, and there were no teachers and no kids around, and uh, my mental health went right through the roof. Second bad decision, leaving coaching football to be an administrator, <laughs> and, and then leaving being a, a principal to be a superintendent. So I started substitute teaching and substitute one day every other week. And being a secondary guy, I went to elementary school and so I started doing kindergarten. And it just was so exciting. And I got to be kind of, I would do that by design. I said, we've got a kindergarten opening up. I was home. And one of the teachers says, it's really great that you come out and do this. And I said, it's kind of my mental health, to tell you the truth. She said, how can I always kindergarten? She said, I, I said, I love those kids. And she said, one day, Dr. Mickus, one day every other week, I said, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> Every day chasing 25-year-olds is a handful. So, but that's what education's all about. It's about kids. And uh, we're really uh, very, uh, very pleased and very uh, honored uh, to be able to get to work with you guys again in a small way, uh, help you carry out what you do for kids, which is unbelievable in the time that you give up. because. And a couple other lives as also a board member. So, you know, I've made all kinds of bad decisions. <laughs> but anyway, um, we're delighted. Uh, some of you um, I know from, uh, from days before, but um, the, our firm, um, we have uh, 15 attorneys, most of whom are education attorneys. Um, and uh, we work with about 300 or so schools, colleges, universities. Uh, charter schools, private schools, uh, all the districts in St. Francis County, St. John, I think Washington, I mean the area and Mineral Area College, and so the area is very, very, very familiar uh, to us. And so um, um, I think uh, I'm very fortunate to be able to work with people like Sarah. And our attorneys are recognized that probably the nicest thing that's happened uh, because I, I get recognized from time to time because I'm so damn old. And uh, you know, if you hang in the business long enough, somebody remembers you. But um, the firm was, two years ago, uh, U.S. News and World Report 
they've had a process of recognizing the outstanding uh, practices, law practices in the country. And two years ago, they, they added to the categories education law. And the firm was selected as the best education practice in Missouri and one of the best in the country. To me, that means more than anything individually because it's the team. And, and you guys have a great team here with your teachers and your staff and parents and everybody working together for these kids. And, and that's, our, that's there in my view, that in order for us to do what we can do to help you, it's, it's uh, secretaries, it's paralegals, it's technology people, it's attorneys, and it doesn't matter. It's to get the, what needs to be done for kids. And so that's what we do. And I'm particularly proud of this young lady who was just selected uh, by the attorneys in Missouri and Kansas as the, uh, the number one outstanding young education attorney in the two state area. So not surprised to me, but it's nice that other people uh, in our profession are recognized here for what she does. So um, pretty diverse practice, but because of the size, we're able to specialize, and we have attorneys that do nothing uh, but special education work. So, which is nice for me because when I get a phone call and said I hear the word special education, I said, "Hold on, let me transfer you." <laughs> because it, this, the business that we do and, and that you do, it changes monthly. Special education changes by the hour, uh, and so you've got to do. That's all you do. And I think we've got a matter that uh, that Ernie's working with you guys on now, and. Um, we, people that specialize in doing real estate work and can, the, the nuances of uh, dealing with uh, public entities and their property and taxation issues and finance issues. Our finance person is, uh, sits on the board at the uh, Kirkwood uh, Board of Education. So uh, it's a pretty uh, diverse group of people, but all very, very dedicated um, and very blessed to be able to work with people like Sarah. I don't know if you want to share some words or if you have thoughts or questions or things. That, you know, we'd be happy to answer. Um, I just want to thank you for having us back there. I've had the opportunity to work with some of your administrators in the past, and a few of the board members here, and it's always been a great experience for us. Uh, one of my personal favorites is Farmington School District. Uh, I always felt that you all very much have the best interests of this. And so we always had a really good working relationship through those issues to come out with the best results. Um, and that makes you feel good at the end of the day. So we're excited to be, have the opportunity to work with you again. It's, uh, I've always had a great deal of uh, respect for Sarah. She makes good decisions with where she practices on what she does, but she's also uh, married to a football coach. <laughs> <laughs> so may argue about that. Uh, Paul Schmanke was uh, the head football coach at Owensville. Two years ago. Two years ago, now he's at Eureka. He actually was one of your coaches for a year. Huh? Had a brief tenure in Farmington and really enjoyed the district, but took a head coach and job at this time. And a fine young man that produced a fine young son as a little, on the 4th of July baby, and yeah. have another one coming in March. <laughs> So uh, it's, that's a good job of balancing. See, it's, easy. it's easy for me to balance in the fall because I don't see my husband anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, remember, I remember those things. <laughs> Are there questions that you have uh, that, that we can uh, answer for you? Um, but we, yeah, we truly are very, very honored uh, to be able to, in a small way, assist you guys in what you, the important work that you do. Anybody have any questions? Have, have you been introduced to everyone, by the way? So, some of them I remember. Some I looked at pictures as I came in the door. <laughs> <laughs> ben? Yes. Tom and Sarah. Tom. Ben, there's this relation that I should have done. The Ben, Sam. Hard to see you. I didn't yeah. really yeah. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Good to you. see nice you. Nice to yeah. Same here. Hi. Good to see you. Hi. Good to see you. And so, and so it's nice to come down and see you when there's no, uh, the pitchforks and the uh, torches are not out and the TV truck with the aerial that goes up uh, 100 feet in the air. When, I, when we drive up to those meetings, it's not so much fun. Uh, and uh, so uh, I, I hope for your sake that we're not regular uh, attendees at your meetings. I was up at a district uh, in north central Missouri, almost near Iowa. Uh, anywhere else it would be Milan, but in Missouri it's Milan. 
uh, and uh, I sat down. And their their board is incredible. They have, I think the the most recent member has been on the board for 12 years, and they go all the way up to 20 something years. And the 20 something year guy said, "How long have you been our attorney?" And I said. I think about 18 years. And he said, I've never seen you at a board meeting. I said, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Don't want to see me at your board meeting. So I said, I'm not sure about coming here because I came into town, I got a speeding ticket. <laughs> so I hope not to repeat that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, or it's a real pleasure to be uh, with you. And we will. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for us. We appreciate you coming, driving all the way down. Ma Would you like some refreshments before you leave? <laughs> some red, white, and blue food? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really good. Well, listen, we'll, we'll pass the book we go. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You guys thank be you. careful driving back home. Okay. So let's go down to. Uh, our summer school report, Miss, Miss Sarah Long, Mrs. Sarah Long. Madam President and board members, I believe you have before you the summer school report uh, for 2012. You'll see that we held an extensive summer school which did include transportation and food service again. Uh, probably the most important figure you will see is the overall ADA and um, we did have an increase from the previous year. This year uh, we averaged 92.6% attendance and had an ADA of 135.7. I did not include it, but last year it was slightly lower than that. It was 115.5, which means we had wonderful participation. For the district, it's truly an opportunity to catch kids up who maybe have a gap during the school year. It gives them an opportunity to continue that learning. Students who are on a reading plan, so summer school really does offer a, a variety of options for our students. I'd be happy to entertain any questions you might have. Great. Would you like for me to just keep plowing through? Yeah, yeah. I have the start of school, so I'll just move on to the, to the next one, which is um, the main thing you will see in the start of school report is we have the percentages of families who attended our open house. And again, we got very positive comments uh, about the staggered times, which allowed them to go to multiple buildings. And then also, our teachers seem to really like that uh, having the rooms ready a couple of days before students come, and then having that kind of quick break, and then coming back on the Tuesday for the final day of in-service and students starting on Wednesday. So that's kudos to all the people who help us develop that calendar committee and make that work. You'll also see the enrollment just on the first day. We have been enrolling students since that first day, so this isn't our final enrollment. Um, probably the one anomaly is you'll notice that Je Jefferson has quite a few more students, and that's because that's where we added that first grade classroom. We had really an overcrowding situation last year in kindergarten. We added a kindergarten teacher right at, at the start of school. Well, that first grade teacher went to Jefferson. So that's an increase in, in their numbers of students as well. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to. I'd just like to say one sure. more time mm -hmm. how much I appreciate all the work that teachers did to prepare their rooms. There was not one classroom that wasn't entirely and completely welcoming. And that's got to feel good to guys when they come back to school. And I know teachers went in a lot of extra hours. They so did. So thanks to everyone Definitely made that possible. Uh, you'll notice a lot of teachers had welcome bags and, and goodies on children's desks. They were very prepared. And, and the buildings looked wonderful. You know, shiny floors and everything Absolutely. was polished. It looked like we were really ready to welcome students. And, and that's what it's all about. Uh, I think the, the next report, if, if there are no questions, and let me just go ahead with the agenda. <laughs> uh, the next report is uh, our APR and ACT, and Matt's going to join me to, to talk about the ACT, but I will go ahead and cover the APR. This is only the preliminary report. We don't have the detailed report yet, and that's um, this is the actual percentage and number that the state uses to accredit schools. And there's a change because uh, the state of Missouri received a waiver under No Child Left Behind. And we've always had two measurements before to tell our progress with students. One of those was the APR, which is what MSIP provides for us. And the other one was AYP, which was the percentage of students who are proficient and advanced based on our assessment data. That 
number and that percentage has gone away over the next three years as the state moves toward common core state standards. So that 14 of 14 points that you see on the APR, that's what you'll see for the next couple of years without that separate federal measurement. And we're also shifting to what's now uh, understood as the fifth cycle of MSIP. Believe it or not, each one of those is five years long. So this is uh, the beginning, the next 25, I guess, years of uh, data for the state. We've already had 20 under that program. And that will change a few of the categories and some of the points. So the 14 after 14, the 14 of 14 that I'm mentioning in this report is based on that fourth cycle MSIP number and in October we're anticipating they'll also give us the fifth cycle data and we'll have both of those measurements until they totally roll over in fifth cycle which is 2015. And then I'll ask Matt to speak to the uh, ACT percentages. Again these are preliminary. I wanted to give an overview um, of the ACT results from the 2012 graduating class. And um, again, with, with the overview, I'm going to give a more detailed report uh, during September. But overall, we had 135 students uh, that took the 2012 uh, test, and that's just, again, the senior class. Uh, overall average was 22.4, which is well above the state average of 21.6 and considerably above the national average of 21.1. Um, in all categories, we actually increased from the 2011. Uh, the sub the subcategories that we test for ACT are uh, the math, the reading, the English, and the science, um, with an overall um, jump in every one of those categories from again from the 2011 test. Uh, we were also well above the state average in every one of those subsections, between 1.2 points and about 0.6 points above the uh, state and more and, and higher above the national average. Um, also very pleased we tested 135 students, which was actually uh, a little bit higher percentage than we tested the year before. So for those numbers to go up with testing a little bit higher percentage uh, was also very positive. Any questions? And again, I'll give a I'll give a more detailed report in September. Thank you. Thank you. No, let's give them Ashley. Go with Pat. Okay. Mr. Pat Burns, how about an update? Just trying to follow along and find out where I was on the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> You're now. <laughs> uh, we have had a busy start to the fall. Uh, we are in the middle of our first full week of activity as far as the high school is concerned right now. Uh, we have in grades 7 through 12 right now in the fall approximately 600 kids involved in some form of a MISHA activity. Uh, that's with eight varsity sports, uh, three middle school sports, and band. So there's a lot going on in a lot of different places. Uh, couple things that we're doing a little bit differently this year. Uh, we have reinstated a ticket procedure for events at the high school. Um, we went with a group called Huddle uh, who basically markets to high schools. We have professional style looking tickets uh, color coded for uh, students and adults and I believe we each uh, we have coupons on the back to McDonald's. Uh, the only thing I think there's 10,000 coupons for free uh, uh, milkshakes. So I don't know. There's not a lot of variety in the coupons that they sent us. Uh, so people are going to eat a lot of milkshakes in the fall. This will help us out as far as being uh, more accountable as far as selling tickets and, and the income that we're bringing in the games. Um, we've instituted, uh, I actually started last spring and we've kind of passed along to the coaches uh, the use of a Twitter feed for communication. Uh, something last spring I started uh, being able to send out scores, announcements, cancellations. Uh, worked real well. Kind of did it sort of on the down low, at least initially last spring, to kind of get a feel for what we were doing. Um, we've developed that, and right now all of the fall sports, uh, the cheerleaders, the pommies, um, the middle school people, have this tool as well. They're able to communicate with their teams a little more directly as far as changes in schedules, uh, uniforms, things of that nature. Um, 
you don't have to have a Twitter feed. You can get it just via text message, which I think is what a lot of people are getting, uh, how they're getting this information. Uh, but I can send, it's like me sending out a text. I send it and within 30 seconds, if it's on your phone and you've signed up for the service, it'll pop up as a text message on your screen. Uh, as far as other things going on, we've met with coaches uh, just as uh, our fall meetings to discuss procedure and policy. Uh, we've spent the last two days, Mr. Rubel and I, with all of our incoming freshmen uh, to go over MISHA policy, eligibility, eligibility policies, uh, things that they need to know as incoming freshmen, and then we'll meet with the upperclassmen the next two days. Uh, the other two big events that we have going on this fall, we have the Great American Football Classic, uh, which the varsity football team is participating in a football game at the Edward Jones Dome in St. Louis on September 15th at 1.30. Tickets are still on sale. And homecoming is September 28th, and we will have information probably within the next two to three days posted on the website concerning parade information. Uh, that's the big thing that people want to know, when the parade's going to start and where it's going to be and how I can sign up. Uh, so we're heading that way, and we'll get that information out here shortly. Uh, other than that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Are you getting a lot of interest in the uh, in the 15th football game? It's there. You know, we haven't had a home football game yet, and I think that's, you know, the, a lot of the schools that are also on the event, uh, some of the St. Louis schools in Sykeston uh, that we're playing, they've taken the opportunity to sell tickets at their home football games. <clears throat> because it's kind of more their, their in crowd. You know, we've been selling them out of the office. The football people have been selling them. The band people have been selling them. Um, I think after Friday night, you know, we're able to pump it up a little bit more and get the word out. You know, we'll, we'll have the opportunity to sell some more tickets. Uh, you know, I think everybody's really excited about the idea. Uh, it's kind of similar to the baseball game that we played at Bush Stadium a couple years ago, getting to play in the big facility in the state or whatever, however you want to view it. Um, but after Friday night, you know, I think the interest level will pick up a little bit more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Pat, the one thing, do you want to tell them a little bit about what to stay tuned for Thursday versus? Well, apparently there's this hurricane floating around out in yeah, the uh, Gulf just, of Mexico. Just be aware. Um, without going into a lot of detail to confuse people, we are looking at our options as far as depending on what the weather is going to be on Friday night in terms of football. Uh, you know, my concern uh, and a lot of athletic directors, I think, in the area who are going to play football Friday night are concerned about not so necessarily the rain, but the thunderstorms and the lightning that are going to come along with this. So we're we're kind of scratching out a more than a tentative plan. But, we're, you know, if we get to a situation on tomorrow afternoon that we'll put into effect, we will communicate that clearly with everyone as far as what's going on. Thank you. Okay, and the next item, um, we, some of us have discussed the possibility of offering an opportunity to some of our local lawyers to be able to uh, offer us some help and be a, be a resource for us. So this particular item is going to be um, an RPF for identifying a pool of local lawyers who, might, who we might be able to access when we have the need. So, Dr. Thomas, is there anything you'd like to... Sure. Add to that. We've, we've had several um, situations come up that really have to do with local juvenile court or um, with domestic issues that have to do with subpoenas and a variety of things where we really felt that um, the ability to be on a very uh, familiar basis with our local courts could be an advantage. So that's really what we're looking for is to identify some attorneys locally that we could access when it's really much more appropriate to have that local reference or service that would be there. And our plan would be to post the RQ um, or RFP, depending oh, on right. whichever way you want. It's request for qualifications or proposals. Um, we are going to notify the Missouri Bar Association to send a notice out so it isn't just people who happen to look at our website. And then depending upon who we get back, we would bring those names to you and you would have a chance to interview those individuals um, that respond. But we're hoping to get two to three attorneys that would be available. And the reason for having several is that in a community as small as this, you could have a case that's a conflict of interest, or you could have a situation where you really needed the resource, but that individual was in court or not available on that particular day. 
that. But these would be cases that are more generic as opposed to education specific cases. All right, anybody have any questions about that, yeah. suggestions or additions? Are we going to advertise in our local paper? It is very expensive to advertise in the paper. Um, we can do that. We thought that contacting the Missouri Bar Association, having emails go out to, to direct them to the website would probably be a way of getting people's attention for all of those attorneys in St. Francis County. We can, but I'm not sure that the local paper would gather as much information as uh, email through the Bar Association, but it would be up to you. Uh, that was our plan. Well, I, I think we need to look at the pol at our board policy because I thought there was something somewhere in board policy that says we have to advertise in the paper for certain things. So I think we just need to look at that before we not do it. Sure. Okay. okay. Okay, so discussion items, we're pulling A and J. Um, we want to discuss the minutes piece and talk about J. Okay. And then we go to action. All right. So um, on the discussion item A is consideration of minutes for July 17th, August 7th, August 14th, so and August 17th. Yes. So I think there was a correction. Yes, correct? on August 17th, the minutes need to be amended. Uh, to show there was a second and the vote was taken on the approval of funds transferred. Okay. And I think probably we've already got that covered, right, yes, Brenda? Uh -huh. Yes. All right. Thank you. And then um, Jay was pulled for discussion as well. Yes. I thought when we discussed the FEMA project, that Mr. Hain was supposed to participate in those, um, that project, the consideration of bids and qualifications. And as far as I know, I did not see his name listed. No, it wasn't invited. So. Did, I didn't realize that. We discussed it a couple months ago at the board meeting. that I, I was not aware of that. I'm not saying we didn't, it's just like that's kind of the first thing that I'm hearing of that. What we did was we recirculated the same list of participants. It was exactly the same list of participants that were invited the first time and you could Except give the names. Could not come. But they were invited for that. And I, w I would have liked to have seen the other proposals in this information so I could have prepared. You may, wanna, you may want to hear a little bit of information because there was very limited response. Yeah. There, so. um, there were only three architectural firms and there were only three project manage management firms. Um, two of the, really the ones that we chose were the only to have any experience in the region. That was one of the first things. There were th several criteria. Um, Jim had a scoring sheet that had the criteria. Had they worked on any FEMA? Did they have any school experience? Did they have any familiarity with the region? One was from St. Louis and one was from Springfield. Okay. Uh, two of the architectural firms. And then we also uh, called around to ask some folks if they had worked with any of these. And if Particularly, a couple of the architectural firms didn't have a super good reputation, including the Board of Engineers had a complaint against one of them for a concrete wall falling down. Uh, the other one was being sued by someone. Um, and then the other, uh, the other project manager had only done emergency information like in Florida. That was the one from Park Hills. So there really wasn't like FEMA experience and FEMA experience. Okay. So the um, committee just kind of went through and said, who do you think isn't appropriate? Then talked through, there yeah, there wasn't really a, a good feel for people who had strong qualifications. Okay. 
I was a, uh, I was a advertised <laughs> to. It was in our newspaper, that and it was required. also on the website. The FEMA requirements on that one was why it was posted in the newspaper because yes. it was required. Well, it was I'm, fairly expensive. It, it sounds like to me, I mean, the, we really didn't have, I mean, it sounds like qualified and everything. I, I don't understand why we didn't reject them or whatever and try to find maybe, you know. Uh, well, we know, it, excuse me, but we yeah. know they know that we have nobody local, correct? That has FEMA experience. That's correct. But we, but we but we put it in our local paper, which is required. That is required. We but then, what else did we do to attract firms that were FEMA knowledgeable? Right. Other than posting on the local paper and then putting it up on our website, we did, we did not nothing. Do it. Okay. But we knew that that well, we knew that Bond was going to come back because they were here before. But I don't feel like we went out and did anything else to get anybody else that had FEMA experience. That's my opinion. That's kind of way I feel. I mean, we didn't try to. Yeah. And, and well, it's the same with trough, though. It, the situation is that we used the engineering firm as well, um, so which is fairly consistent. So it wasn't just the issue with the architect. It was those people who have familiar familiarity that were accessed to help us with the original FEMA grant to begin with. So you already have that track set up. The posting was there, but it wasn't any different for Bond Wolf than it was for our engineers or our project managers. But there was only three, three that responded? Which is, know. from my understanding, not unusual when you have a FEMA grant because they are aware. The architects are generally aware that you've already had to do so much work already to get to that point to do the application, that if they haven't been involved early on, it is not uncommon for them to do that. It's sort of like getting the architectural plans for your house and then going somewhere else. What we were told is that it's not unusual to have very few people at this point get involved when they haven't been involved at the very beginning of the application. Uh, the TOF group has extensive experience with FEMA, SEMA. Uh, more than 90 different, that's the engineering firm and the project manager. Okay, any other discussion? Yeah, I, I do remember, and I think helped me with this, but I do remember back when we visited with all those people and, and went through this process before, we were very particular in saying that we'll open this back up and make sure that this particular company doesn't have everything cornered here because we want to be able to give other people the opportunity because before it was preliminary. But I don't know that we've made that outreach. I don't know that we've done that. All right, so we'll move on to, any, I'm sorry, anyone else have any discussion or comments? Okay, then we'll move on to our action items. And I need a motion to approve the consensual items with the exception of A, C. No, you want A. I'm sorry, with C, D, and J. General obligation refunding bonds. Let's see. And this is a roll call vote. Is this a roll call vote? Okay. So I need a motion to approve. So moved. And a second. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Oh, sorry. Who did that second? Kevin. Thank you. Kevin. 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 Yes. Haynes. Yes. Howard. Yes. Davis. Yes. Harrington. Yes. Wesley. Yes. Marcus yes. Okay, and I need a motion to approve 
D, which is the approval of tax rate for 2012-2013 school year. As proposed by the administration. As proposed by the administration. I'll make that motion. Second. Yes. Payne. Yes. Howard. Yes. Davis. Yes. Harrington. Yes. Lawson. Yes. Roethlisberger. Yes. Can you a motion to approve the architectural project management and engineering for the FEMA project? I'll make a motion. Second. All those in favor? Well, that's not a roll call. Okay. Okay. Okay, all those in favor? Okay, now I need a motion to adjourn to post session. Second. So oh, I'm sorry. All that? those opposed? Okay. Okay, now how about a motion to adjourn to closed session? I make a motion to adjourn to closed session and discuss personnel pursuant to 610021, paragraphs 1, 3, and 13 regarding personnel. Need a second. Second. Motion made and second. Roll call. Um, yes. Okay. Yes. Howard. Yes. Davis. Yes. Harrington. Yes. Lawson. Yes. Roethlisberger. Yes. 